people who have been taking classes for you. Uh, I was a 2006 password batch, uh, 2006 batch, and I did my PG in pathology in Jibma, and now working as an associate consultant in a cancer hospital in Bangalore. My core is oncopathology and molecular pathology. These two are my core. Fine. So um, you can be free with me. Whatever doubts you have, you can ask to me. I hope most of you are in second year. Any doubts under the sky, you can ask to me. I'll be there to help. I like teaching. I've been teaching. I was teaching with Institute called DAMS for the past few years. And now I've moved on uh, to hardcore diagnostic field. Fine. So I'll be using uh, this part for teaching. Okay, just a second. I'll be using a surface note for teaching. What I'll be doing is I'll be writing it out so that uh, if you guys are old school like me who like writes to like to write notes and learn, this will be the best way. Fine, just a second. Just a second, okay? So today's topic is about lung tumors. Before moving on to lung cancers as such, I want you to uh, know that how well do you know about tumors as such? Because knowing tumors, knowing cancers makes it very simple for us to learn about any type of cancer, right? So I'm sure that most of you guys will know about cancer. Cancer is nothing but an abnormal malignancy tissue, right? Malignant tissue. And today we are going to see about lung cancer. Just what's going to be there in the lung. Like any other tumor, lung can also have primary tumors and metastatic tumors. I'm just going to broadly divide them. So the overview of the class will be what all tumors I can see in lung, what will be the etiology of lung cancers, microscopic finding of each and every tumor, if there is any classification of lung cancers, subclassification will be seeing that, clinical features will be seeing, and how I'm going to finally nail the coffin by diagnosing it. And obviously treatment aspect will be taken in medicine, right? That's what we're going to do. Anywhere you find any problem you're not understanding, you can raise your hand or you can chat with me. I can see your chat and I'll be able to answer your questions, fine? So the first thing we are going to go is about classification. I don't like the traditional way of PowerPoint teaching. So I used to write and teach. So it's much better for me. I hope it's better for you as well. So we divide lung cancers primarily into two major groups. We divide them into primary lung tumors and we divide them into secondary lung tumors. Secondary means metastasis, right? Which means I can have a person can have a breast cancer which can spread to the lung. Instead of presenting as a breast cancer, primarily they present as in lung cancer, right? Metastasis to lung. A person with a brain cancer can go into the lung. That's metastasis, right? Primary means problem in the lung parenchyma, in the alveoli, bronchus, bronchial, anywhere. If it gives rise to a cancer, that's a primary lung cancer, right? When we take as a whole, secondary tumors in the lung are more common than primary. This may look a, bit, a little bit weird, but secondary tumors or metastatic deposit to the lung are more common than primary. First, you need to understand why. Why do many cancers, why do preferentially they go into the lung? The reason, one of the main reason is the blood supply. I'm sure in your physiology and anatomy, you must have read about liver and lung are the one of the main two main organs which has maximum blood supply, right? Because of maximum blood supply going to the lung and tiny, tiny capillaries, right? They are like filters. They can filter out the tumor cells in the circulation and they have a very favorable place to grow. So secondaries or metastasis is more common in the lung, right? That's one thing. Primary lung cancers, we are going to divide primary lung cancers broadly into squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma. There are multiple subdivisions. I'm just going to go to broad divisions, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, I'm just studying squamous, which means squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and neuroendocrine carcinoma. Okay. Or neuroendocrine based tumors. Fine. These are broad classification of primary lung cancer. I'm sure you know what is a squamous cell carcinoma, right? Epithelium of bronchus bronchial is going to be squamous epithelium. A tumor coming from that is squamous cell carcinoma. Adeno means glands. When a tumor looks like gland in microscopy, I'm going to call it adenocarcinoma, right? And I will let's little bit go back to physiology and anatomy or histology, where you must have read something called as an enterochromaffin cells, right? I'm sure you guys must have read about enterochromaffin cells. 
which part of the body you will see entochromaffin cells or entochromaffin like cells those i want you to answer if you know the answer you can type it and send it to me fine great great ashwati git right so like that i can have entochromaffin cells or entochromaffin like cells which can secrete impulses in all the parts of the body majority in git i can have them in the lung as well so those tumors coming from secretory cells i'm going to call it neuroendocrine endocrine is secretion right so i'm going to call them as neuroendocrine tumors so i have different types of lung tumors and different different origins of these lung tumors there is primary versus secondary that's about the first half of today's topic we'll go to next next subdivision we are going to go to etiology right we're going to go to etiology so etiology is fascinating medicine is not about diagnosis and medicine is not about just diagnosis and treatment no medicine is a lifestyle we have to learn medicine with passion i'll tell you what happens let's just go and look at the way environment and modification of human being causes different different cancers i just told you three cancers right squamous adeno and neuroendocrine don't write this i'll tell when to write so what happened is i am sh sure all of you guys know that one of the most common etiology or causes of lung cancer is smoking over the period of years what has happened is squamous cell carcinoma incidence has become low adeno carcinoma incidence has become high people are not knowing why it's also said that adeno carcinoma is seen in women don't write this i'll tell more in detail whenever we come to the topic adeno carcinoma is more seen in non smokers that doesn't fit right smoking actually is increased over the period of time it never decreases and once a smoker always a smoker for life but still statistics wise we are seeing that there's a drastic or slow gradual shift towards adeno carcinoma scientists were perplexed why this is happening then they went into basics you won't believe that what i'm going to say is the reason why squamous cell carcinoma became adeno carcinoma when you were in school days i'm sure you must have seen uh, advertisements of bd all over right i'm sure you must have seen though they have stopped in the uh, small small shops you must have seen over the period of time the advertisement of bd has stopped the smoking habit has changed a lot it has become filtered cigarettes everywhere filtered cigarettes the purpose of filter is to reduce cough that's the purpose of filter because when you put a filter the big big particles will reduce in size and will gradually and is gradually going into uh, the deep uh, alveoli it gradually moves to the deep alveoli right so that's the purpose of filter so what happens here is when a person is going to smoke i'm just going to talk about smoking and cancer smoke and lung cancer i want you to write this down if you are writing it down when a person has a crude variant of smoke a crude variant of smoke like a bd or any crude variant of smoke the particles of smoke will rest in bronchus okay it's going to rest in bronchus it just rests in the bronchus because they are bigger when it rests in the bronchus slowly over the period of time over the period of years it will cause tiny little bit of mutations in the bronchus tiny bit of change in the bronchus this will increase the risk of squamous cell carcinoma crude variant of smoke here i mean bd only the thicker ones big particles and the fine variant of smoke which is going to be filtered in a filtered variant of smoke they are very very tiny this goes and reaches the alveoli when it reaches alveoli it increases the risk of adenocarcinoma so smoking type also determines what type of cancer it is i am not saying this 100% you can still have a judgment with just with this variant of smoke the person is smoking so i have given you two datas you are going to now process and tell me where do you see them in lung let's uh, draw a lung like this right let's draw a lung this is going to be a lung i'm drawing two uh, numbers in the lung 1 and 2 you are going to tell me in one the location one this is your hilum of the lung the bronchus in location one 
what type of cancer you will see squamous or adeno just with the history and whatever the etiology we learnt in the number 1 what you will see squamous or adeno perfect you're going to see squamous crude variant of smoke it stops here and i'm going to have problems i'm going to see squamous there see again it's a hint for me so which means hilar lesions most likely not always most likely squamous so how does it help as a doctor you're not going to look at the lung but yes i'll take an x ray right you'll take an x ray you'll take an imaging guidance patient comes with cough hemoptysis so and so symptom take an x ray i'm having a big lesion here most likely squamous i'll take a biopsy and we'll prove it but still i'll have a history so this is a big lesion so it can erode the bronchus and the patient can present with hemoptysis correct but a lesion here close to the pleura this is your pleura close to the pleura when i have a lesion it will not cause hemoptysis it will not cause hemoptysis because it it needs to be grow very big to cause symptom also most of the adenocarcinomas are diagnosed late because they are going to be slowly 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 growing unless and until it's become sufficiently big it's not going to present it presents late in time right these are the extrapolations you have a fact the fact should be extrapolated this is not required for us but to understand yes it's very very important for us fine so smoke is a cause of lung cancer next thing we are going to extrapolate and we are not going to just stop with this smoke here so when you have a person who is a smoker do all smokers get cancer the answer will be no i am sure you must have seen people in your life though you are starting your life as a doctor when you go and start taking history or when you talk with generally with your uh, contemporary uh, maybe 50 60 year old person you must have seen smokers for sure in your life not everyone will get cancer you go and talk to a smoker you tell that uh, there's a risk of lung cancer for you, you say they'll say that with pride right with false pride they'll say that i've been smoking for 20 30 years nothing will happen strong body wrong strong genetics not all smoker will have lung cancer the reason is genetics smoker will they have lung cancer no because smoke is an indirectly acting carcinogen it's not a directly acting carcinogen it's an indirectly acting carcinogen so what do i mean by this is i am sure you must have read in your pharmacology something called as pro drugs have you heard of them pro drugs and drugs any idea i'm sure you must have heard of them pro drugs is an inactive form so smoke is also like a pro drug it's an inactive form it's an indirectly acting carcinogen means when a person smokes it's an inactive form so from the inactive form it has to be converted to an active metabolite only this active metabolite will be able to cause cancer will be able to cause mutation right so who transfers them is cyp enzymes does it ring a bell same cyp enzymes converts your pro drug to an active drug you must have read in uh, tuberculosis if you have covered tuberculosis isony acid slow acetylates and fast acetylates they are variations the same thing happens here so when a person has more amount of the cyp enzyme more active metabolite more risk of a cancer that's what happens right so there is genetic predisposition as well not all smokers will have cancer if by luck by birth the person is not having a cyp enzyme the person may not have a cancer even if the person smokes for 100 years right so there will be a genetic predisposition which increase the risk of cancer in smokers okay based on the cyp enzymes the as of now may not be required so much for a clinical medicine but yeah maybe in future when genetics becomes big this may also be considered so smoke is the majority reason or etiology for lung cancer the second most etiology is going to be pollution you cannot stop it it's also very into smoke pollution also increases the risk of cancer okay not only pollution we have a few more things as well uh, like uh, in particular environment like, like like let's say example chernobyl you must have read about chernobyl you must have seen the chernobyl incident as well 
So Chernobyl like condition, like industrial hazards, industry related, but there's going to be in very, very close or in a look a particular population only like Chernobyl. People who have worked in Chernobyl has a risk of many, many cancers. Not only that, one more important thing, asbestos. Asbestos exposure will increase the risk of lung cancer. Not only lung cancer, even pleural cancer called mesothelioma. We'll see them as well. Fine. Silicosis. Silica is nothing but sand. And the lung, other pneumoconiosis, you must have read them. All those also is a risk for cancer. So we know about pollution, we know about these industrial risks, and also we know about the majority which is smoke. Next one is mutations, very important. See, off late, mutations are the one which are being concerned like anything. We are reading lots about mutations just because I need to understand which all causes cancer so that I can try to treat them and I can try to destroy them. So I'm going to go with the same thing, squamous, adeno, neuroendocrine. What do what are the common mutations I see here? Do remember a few things. Whichever I say remember, do remember. I'll also tell why you should remember. So in a lung adenocarcinoma, I want you to remember EGFR mutation will be present. Epidermal growth factor receptor mutation. You will have KRAS mutation. And also you'll have ALK. Um, Robbins will give many more mutations. I don't want you to remember everything. I don't want you to at the same time forget these three because these three are very important. When an oncologist gives me the biopsy, when a reporter is lung cancer, the oncologist asks for these three marker, these three mutations 100%. Because if a person is EJ for positive, it has good prognosis. Care as positive, it has poor prognosis. ALK also a little bit of good, good prognosis because they haven't targeted therapy. In CML, you must have read about imatinib, rituximab. You must have heard of them. I have, can target the particular mutation and can have a better prognosis. So oncologist knows because it matters to the patient. Pathologist knows because I'm going to give the mutation. An MBBA student or any medical doctor should know because it has an implication in the pathogenesis. If there's no implication, don't read anything. Forget it. If there's an implication, you must read, right? Next, squamous and small cell. This I won't emphasize much. Squamous, TP53 mutation and P16 mutation because squamous and small cell, that is neuroendocrine, as of now, mutation doesn't have a more important role here. I'll write small cell carcinoma. Small cell carcinoma is a neuroendocrine carcinoma. New small cell carcinoma has again retinoblastoma gene, RB gene mutation, and TP53 mutation. These are the common ones seen. But never forget it for adenocarcinoma. For adenocarcinoma is extremely important for me because I need to know it because my prognosis is based on that. Fine. So next question comes: Will lung cancer occur in a smoke? Never smoker. Will it happen? Yes, it will happen. Lung cancer can happen in non-smokers as well. Very rare, but ten percent rarely it does happen. Lung cancer in non-smokers is possible. Never smoker doesn't mean that if a person has lung cancer it means he's a smoker. Don't brand it. It's possible in a person who has never ever inhaled smoke. They are generally due to mutations, and the common mutations in non-smokers again EGFR, and the microscopy will be adenocarcinoma. Fine. This is about the etiology. We saw about primary and secondary classification till now, and we saw a little bit about the etiology of lung cancers. Next thing we are going to see is going to see is subclassification. In this subclassification, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go order one one tumor wise, like squamous first. What we'll see in squamous is we'll see little. We'll, I'll cover the little bit of etiology what you have done till now, location, history, any other paraneoplastic syndrome, how to diagnose, and how to completely do the IHC as well, entire workup of a lung cancer. Because if in an exam point of view, uh, lung tumors can be a essay question for you. I want you to cover squamous adeno neuroendocrine. There are further other tumors as well, not much important for you, fine? So first we'll go to squamous cell carcinoma of lung. 
see passing an mbbs exam is the easiest thing you'll ever do in life i'm sure you must have crossed your first year what you must have done you must have written 50 pages one page one mark for anatomy that's what you do right do the same thing here do it bit dignified that's all as a doctor your professor who is correcting the exam will not know robins i can write and give 100% medicine professor will not know harrison pharmacology professor will not know tripathi don't worry what they will know is the common things they have learned during the mbbs and common things which they are practicing during day to day life so for any disease follow the same protocol squamous cell carcinoma i need etiology so etiology the most common etiology is smoke i'm going to write that smoking if you want to make it bigger add one more point smoking not all smokers will get cancer and there's a predisposition genetically based on cyp enzymes because smoke is an indirectly acting carcinogen if you want to add even more add crude smoke also smoking should be chronic an acute one or two puff of smoke will not cause cancer any carcinogen should be chronic i generally don't write use the term chronic smoker because all smokers are chronic by default they are chronic once a smoker always a smoker okay rarely you can have mutations squamous cell carcinoma mutation relation is very rare okay pathogenesis next thing for any exam not only for pathology even when you go to surgery medicine og pediatrics any subject etiology pathogenesis clinical feature diagnosis treatment these five headings should be there and each of the heading one man point is enough to clear everything not only clear everything practice medicine till 80 years of life that's enough i just need those few things that's all pathogenesis i told that we have a squamous lining normal squamous lining normal squamous mucosa when you have a smoke the cigarette smoke will damage the mucosa little bit of damage so first what happens is i'm going to have uh, something called this sorry not this not this i just make a change here the normal mucosa of respiratory lining is not squamous normal mucosa is ciliated columna right this my mistake pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium fine so from ciliated columnar because of smoke a change happens i am sure you know that what is the change which happens what do we call this in the first chapter of robins you must have read the cellular adaptations what do we call this ciliated columnar epithelium smoke comes perfect metaplasia right metaplasia what does meta mean i want you to divide everything and learn meta means change Plasia means growth. Simple. You must have known meta means change right from your school days. Metamorphosis, change in morphology. Right. Meta means change. So this ciliated columnar epithelium, due to smoke, it changes to squamous. It changes to squamous. I'm going to have squamous metaplasia. Okay. I have squamous metaplasia. Metaplasia is reversible. Metaplasia is not irreversible. It is reversible. If a patient present to me is squamous metaplasia, I'll tell them stop smoking. You can be saved. But people don't listen to us, like us only. We'll still continue smoking. We'll still continue smoking. This squamous metaplasia is going to become abnormal. Do you know any technical term for abnormality? Like we had meta for change. What is the technical term for abnormality? Okay, tell me the technical term for abnormal breathing or difficulty in breathing. perfect dysplasia this means abnormal dyspnea dysphagia this means abnormal right so i'm going to have dysplasia next so this metaplasia is going to become squamous dysplasia this means abnormal plasia means growth i just want you to know the terminologies once it becomes squamous dysplasia here also early degrees are reversible later degree will become irreversible right so the person will not stop smoking the person will still smoke it becomes squamous cell carcinoma so i'm sure in your neoplasia chapter you must have learned what's the difference between a dysplasia and a carcinoma there's one major difference to call it dysplasia from carcinoma the major difference is basement membrane invasion you must have learned that right you must have learned the uh, 
carcinoma in situ without basement membrane breach when it goes below basement membrane i'm going to call it carcinoma right so this is what happens in the pathogenesis slowly one one mutation keeps accumulating and becomes a squamous cell carcinoma fine next so here till this part more or less reversible here it becomes irreversible so i know the pathogenesis as well next i need to know how the patient presents to me clinical inputs then we'll go to the diagnosis clinical presentation there can be of two types one can be due to the tumor location and everything one i don't know what is the cause that we group it them as paraneoplastic syndrome i'm sure you must have heard about it clinical i'm going to divide in two things due to tumor location and everything or due to some other unknown cause called as paraneoplastic syndrome i'm sure you must have heard about it right name any one paraneoplastic syndrome not related to lung anything whatever you know you name it not related to lung i don't want anything related to lung tell any paraneoplastic syndrome you know i'm sure you know it right polycythemia great for renal cancer hypercalcemia for this cushing's sadh perfect right cushing's many things right it can present as paraneoplastic syndrome as well so when you see paraneoplastic syndrome always one of the paraneoplastic syndrome which squamous cell carcinoma of lung presents is hypercalcemia okay do remember this when you see a patient with hypercalcemia first don't think of lung cancer that's the most important mistake we do we always think of cancer because when you diagnose a cancer or a syndrome it gives euphoria for me saying that wow i am a great doctor no cancer syndromes occur in 2% of the entire disease spectrum identifying treating 98% you are a great doctor identifying treating 2% you are not a great doctor but when i am ruling out all the cause of hypercalcemia i should not miss paraneoplastic syndrome also that makes you the best rule out every common cause first then keep this also in mind due to tumor i can have blood in the sputum hemoptysis if the tumor is sufficiently big in the bronchus it can cause breathing difficulty dyspnea sometimes rarely they also present with pneumonia the reason is i'll tell why as well they can also present with pneumonia not always but yes they can present with pneumonia because let's assume that this is bronchus it is divided from the main stem bronchus and let's say we have a lung here i'm having a tiny little cancer here when i have this cancer here this part will obstruct in my mucus exchange right definitely it's not going to be smooth i have bump my mucus exchange will not be smooth so what happens below this area this part is going to be the mucus of the lung will get accumulated you have mucus retention whenever you have mucus retention mucus is nothing but protein you must have read in microbiology all the broths in which microorganisms grow are proteins so i'm having an effective place where microorganisms can divide because of that there is a risk of pneumonia so pneumonia could be the presentation as well for every pneumonia you will take a chest x ray you see a mass think of squamous cell think of some tumor right that's how it can the patients can present primary due to tumor i am just writing only one main important thing there are many paraneoplastic syndrome listed in your uh, robins textbook i'll add the salient one with squamous adenoid and squamous cell carcinoma fine so i know the presentation as well so i need to work up a person has come to you 68 year old person came with hemoptysis you are the doctor was sitting what you will do you are the doctor was seeing the patient what will you do you won't do anything you must have investigate right you examine the patient you auscultate the patient you have all the findings then i am going to take a chest x ray i am leaving the inspection palpation auscultation everything i'm just jumping onto chest x ray i'll do a radiological investigation in x ray i will see the squamous cell carcinoma in in the center they are called as central lesions whenever in any textbook related to lung when you know call uh, been referred as central lesions which means it is close to the hilum it's close to the hilum of lung peripheral lesion is close to the pleura 
central lesions are close to the hilum of the lung. That's one first finding. I have central lesions. This squamous cell carcinoma. Have any one of you seen squamous cell carcinoma in your clinics? You must have seen ulcers of the foot. Not in lung. Ulcers of foot. Have you seen? Have you seen a diabetic foot ulcer? Corona has destroyed everything. No. Okay, fine. You will definitely see squamous cell carcinoma of skin, foot especially when you go back to when you resume your clinics or when you go to your third or fourth uh, standard so, uh, MBBS. Fine. So when you go there, the first and the foremost thing what your surgical textbook of DAS says is squamous cell carcinoma are cauliflower-like lesions. Have you uh, heard this at least? Cauliflower-like fungating mass. Squamous cell carcinoma can become huge, big, big, big ones. So here also, in the central lesion, it can become huge. You are going to tell me the second finding in chest X-ray. You guys know. Be confident. If it's wrong, don't worry. And I'm not going to see you ever in my life. Nor you are going to see me ever in my life, right? So I'm going to have a tumor, which is going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, huge. So what will happen to the center of the tumor? Think and answer. Pathologically, think and answer. What will happen to the center of the tumor? Live or dead? Perfect. Necrosis. Perfect. Necrosis. Dead cell. So the next day, what I'm going to see is someone said you're going to see cavity in X-ray. A clue again. I'm going to see. I'm just erasing this part. I'm going to see cavity in X-ray. That's just because of central necrosis, right? Cavity in X-ray, which is due to central necrosis. Which is again secondary to the huge size because squamous cell carcinoma has the tendency to grow big. Again, a clue, because when we come to neuroendocrine, that also can happen in the center, in the close to the hilum, but they'll not grow huge. They will not have cavity. I am trying to differentiate right from history, smoking habit, X-ray, and then confirm a microscopy. Right? Cavity will be there and be a central lesion. Okay. Next, biopsy. You're going to take a biopsy. I'll look at the biopsy and say, yes, this is squamous cell carcinoma. Fine. So we'll go from normal and how everything will look. I'm sure you know the normal thing. Normal, you'll have your tiny ciliated pseudocytopic columnar epithelium. You have tiny ciliated pseudocytopic columnar epithelium. When it becomes squamous metaplasia, you're going to tell me again how it will look. When it becomes squamous metaplasia. I'm sure you must have not diagnosed squamous metaplasia till now, but you can easily diagnose it. You just need to know basics. Tell me the full name of squamous epithelium. We call something what squamous? Dash squamous histology. Stratified, perfect. Stratified. What does stratified mean? Stratified means multiple. Perfect. That's all I need to know. This guy. Normal columnar is pseudo stratified, single layer. So squamous is multiple layer. Enough. You are sorted with the diagnosis, right? That's all is required. I have multiple layers. The cells will be multi layer. That's all is required. So I am simplifying it for you to diagnose. If an image is given, you can easily diagnose. It's not all pink and blue. Pink and blue can make wonders. Multiply multiple layers. Stratified is squamous metaplasia. Fine. The next one, I know squamous metaplasia. The sec next stage is dysplasia, right? The next stage is going to be dysplasia. It'll move to dysplasia. Again, you are going to say me how dysplasia will look in my microscopy. This means abnormal. Your neoplasia chapter is over, right? I'm sure you must have read about a few classical hallmarks of uh, dysplasia. One of them is high NC ratio. I'm sure you must have heard. In a high NC ratio, what is more? Nucleus is more. What is the color of nucleus? In a biopsy, what is the color of nucleus? That's all is required. In a biopsy, the color of nucleus. Blue. Enough. If you know this, you can identify squamous dysplasia. Here, in metaplasia, the predominant will be pink because cytoplasm is pink. Squamous is a polygonal cell, bigger. When it becomes dysplasia, I'll have the same stratification. But I'll have a big pleomorphic 
nuclei, hyperchromatic, like someone said, big hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei. It will be huge. I know that it's dysplastic. All layers, I call it carcinoma in situ. I have still not called it carcinoma. Next, I'm going to call it carcinoma. Then I have two findings. I'll call it squamous cell carcinoma. I'm writing SCC for squamous cell carcinoma. The first and the most important finding is invasion. Invasion of basement membrane. Very important. I'm in your histology, you must have read that basement membrane is the lowermost layer of the epithelium. When it invades, it goes to the dermis. In skin, it goes to the dermis. Here, it goes to the subepithelial tissue. Invasion of basement membrane, cancer. Anywhere you see invasion, cancer. And one more pattern, a pattern is called as an keratin pearl. It's called as a keratin pearl. If you see keratin pearl anywhere from now on, you're going to think only one diagnosis, squamous cell carcinoma, nothing else. Fine. I, I, if I have a picture of keratin pearl, I will show you. I should have. Just a sec. It's not opening. Yeah. Uh, just for an overview, this is a normal alveoli, 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 air in the alveoli, air in the alveoli, right? This is a normal alveoli, just for our understanding, fine? If I have an image of keratin pearl, I should show you this. This person here is in keratin pearl, right? This guy is a keratin pearl. This entire one, keratin pearl, keratin pearl, all these are keratin pearl. It looks like a whirl. Pink color whirl is a keratin pearl because keratin, nucleate or anucleate, everything comes from first year only. That's enough. Keratin is anucleate. So keratin pearl will be pink in color because when it's anucleate, no blue color in biopsy, it's going to be pink in color. Pink color whirls, it is keratin pearl, right? And if you have a keratin pearl, you can call it safely a squamous cell carcinoma. Anywhere, skin or esophagus or anal canal or lung, anywhere is the same thing, fine? So now I know it is keratin pearl. It's squamous cell carcinoma. Um, lymphomas are over, right? WBC disorders is over. WBC disorders. Yes, great. Who took Pratap? Pratap must have taken. Pratap is my cousin, right? So when I didn't call him Pratap, sir. Okay. So he must have told about CD markers. To diagnose lymphomas, you use CD markers, right? So here, also I need to diagnose a cancer. I need to use markers. For any cancer, I'm going to use markers. The marker or immunohistochemistry, it is called as IHC. IHC stands for immunohistochemistry. So IHC, two markers, do remember, P40 and P63. Not 53, 63. These are two markers for lung primary squamous cell carcinoma. So my diagnosis is sorted. So we know etiology, we know pathogenesis, we know clinical features, we know X-ray findings, we know how it looks in microscopy, we know the markers as well. Treatment, the surgeon will take care of it or medicine person will take care of it, right? We know everything about squamous cell carcinoma. Then we'll move on to the second tumor, which is adenocarcinoma, fine? Second one, what you're going to see is, we're going to see about adenocarcinoma. Okay, we go to lung primary adenocarcinoma. Of the lung. From clinical history, uh, this uh, what I'm going to say in the next few uh, things are not for your practice, but to solve the clinical scenario given in your uh, university exams. That's all. Adenocarcinoma. Generally, it is said that it's more common in the foreign countries. Adenocarcinoma is generally said it's more common in non-smokers. Adenocarcinoma is generally said it's more common in women. Not in real life for your university exams. If you have these clues, think of an adenocarcinoma. Have that in the back of the mind. There will be few clues for you to diagnose. 
It's more common abroad, Caucasians. It's more common in women and non-smokers. In real life, you're not going to diagnose anything because it's, uh, okay, this is a 70-year-old female. I'm going, not going to say it's adenocarcinoma of lung. But for a university exam, to solve a question, this might be a clue. Fine. Etiology, again, adenocarcinoma. Chunk of the adenocarcinoma is because of mutations. And we know the mutations as well. Name the mutation. I told you to remove three mutations. At least name one. Second one. Uh, perfect. EGFR, Keras, great. You named all the two, one ALK, perfect. Filtered smoke. Environmental pollution. Passive smoke. All these are going to push towards adenocarcinoma. It's a filtered variety of smoke, so it can travel till my alveoli and mutations, all the three major mutations you mentioned. So I know about it. I need to know about the pathogenesis. So for pathogenesis, we look at smoke related and also we look at mutation related in a completely non-smoker, what's gonna happen. So here, when it's smoke related, it's a fine variant of smoke. It goes to my alveoli. In the alveolar epithelium, it's going to cause damage. The smoke will cause mutation. I showed you the normal alveoli. It had a shape, right? It was like this, around or oval or something. So when it causes damage, I'll have also have a cancer in the same way. I'll have a cancer in the same way. That's the reason I'm going to call it adenocarcinoma. Adeno means glands. It looked like glands once it becomes cancerous, right? It's going to look like glands look like this once it becomes cancerous. The blue ones I'm drawing are cancer cells. So more or less, it looks like glands, right? That's why it's termed as adenocarcinoma. Adeno stands for glands. Okay. Same mutation, whatever smoke causes. So why do I see uh, mutations in a non-smoker? Why don't I see squamous cell carcinoma in a non-smoker? And why do I see adenocarcinoma in a non-smoker? Those are logical questions should come to you. It'll come to you, don't worry. So never smoker, why there is adenocarcinoma and why there is no squamous cell carcinoma. See, let's assume that you have a big lung. In this lung tissue, I have right from a trachea, below that bronchus, bronchioles, the 19, 20 divisions of bronchioles, finally your asini, then alveoli. That's how you have the architecture of lung, histology and anatomy wise. So in this big architecture of lung, which cells do you think are very, very fragile? The bronchiole or the alveoli? Definitely the alveoli. Very flimsy, very fragile. So they'll die faster. When they die faster, they will regenerate. Alveoli will be kept, kept on replenishing. Like your skin, skin loses, it also comes back. So in alveoli, a cell dies, a cell comes. A cell dies, a cell comes. In other words, my cell division is faster. Am I right in saying that? Am I right in saying that in alveoli, my cell division is faster? Yes. So now we'll go to cell division linking to your biochemistry. In your biochemistry, you must have read that during every cell division, during every DNA duplication, there is a chance of a mutation. But your DNA polymerase handles that because it has a proofreading activity. It destroys everything. Your nucleotide mismatch mechanism, all those mechanisms will rectify the error. You must have read that, right? So when it happens again and again and again and again, over the period of years, 60, 70 years, one tiny thing can go away, can go wrong, can have a mutation, can have a cancer. I don't have that in squamous because the cells in my bronchus or trachea is not replaced at a very fast rate compared to my adenocarcinoma, my alveolar cells, right? Why in never smoker adenocarcinoma? The reason is that adenocarcinoma are more common because alveoli, the rate of replacement is faster. When the rate of replacement is faster, there is a chance of an error. 
there is a chance of a mutation not always one time one unfortunate day it becomes mutated there is more chance of a mutation when there is more chance of a mutation you will have an increase in risk of cancer see don't read anything factually you will forget the very next day put a logic try to link the subjects you will remember for long why i never smoke adenocarcinoma this is the reason and also we know the fine variant of smoke why it cause adenocarcinoma that's a reason i will also tell why women have more adenocarcinoma simple reason you must have uh, been around men as well as women how many women smokers do you see less don't say there are no women smokers women do smoke and there is nothing wrong in it men they have to smoke means they need 10 rupees that's all they'll smoke that's the only qualifying criteria for men being a smoker for women being a smoker they should be in a higher socio economic status not every women can smoke right the top bosses will ambani's wife might i don't know i don't have no hatred towards her but yes socio economic status is more important for women to smoke a higher socio economic status person will never take bd for smoke will always use filtered smoke fine variant of smoke particles is very very small causes adenocarcinoma that's why women squamous carcinoma is rare if you have a doubt take a cohort of women give them only bd squamous cell carcinoma only will happen because etiology links to pathogenesis links to the disease that's reason we have different different etiology in different genders everything will have a reason right we know about adenocarcinoma now we need to know about the clinical features clinical features of adenocarcinoma is not so easy to diagnose like a squamous cell carcinoma because they are going to be in the periphery of the lung they don't present most of the time right in adenocarcinoma they are usually diagnosed late because of presentation right because of presentation they are usually diagnosed late if at all they present they will present with cough because they are lesions close to the pleura when i have a lesion close to the pleura it will irritate the pleural membrane so i can have a cough i can central airway also can have a cough right okay so or it can present with an pleural effusion it's close to the pleura it can irritate the pleura i can have an collection in the pleural cavity can present as a pleural effusion in the worst case scenario it can go beyond the pleura and also can go to my ribs and can erode my ribs that's a worst case scenario the ribs involvement but all this said and done pleural effusion is also like in high grade right it's not so earlier right it's later cough chest pain can also be there the chest pain doesn't mean that it's myocardial infarction it's a pleuritic pain the pleura is involved so a pleuritic pain all of them are going to present late compared to my squamous cell carcinoma x-ray finding squamous was central lesion i didn't know it's not central i didn't know it's close to the pleura i didn't know are peripheral lesions okay i didn't know cause some of peripheral lesions it happens in the periphery of the lung right and they not be huge they'll be small only they'll be tiny and the most important clue this is very important for you when you go to practice i didn't know carcinoma of lung primary will be single lesions do write them in bigger letters single lesions they'll be single solitary lesion okay thank you sir there'll be solitary lesion okay next uh so here why i emphasize on the word single is let's take uh peripheral multiple lesions my entire approach is going to change because periphery and multiple my first thought will be of metastasis i'm going to think of metastasis okay periphery multiple metastasis in a chest x-ray you also should be thinking of metastasis i'm not saying that adenocarcinoma cannot be multiple in general single can be multiple as well but i can try to narrow down my differential diagnosis with history and everything not to wait for a biopsy fine i know the x-ray finding we know the clinical features we know the etiology as well now i need to diagnose in diagnosis 
I have a little bit of stages. Like what we saw in squamous, metaplasia, dysplasia, and then carcinoma, here also I have a little bit of staging. Not exactly the same. I'm going to term, term uh, them differently. The first one is called as an atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. Okay. Atypical adenomatous hyperplasia this is the first one. Normal, then atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. After that, it's going to move to adenocarcinoma in situ. That's the second one, adenocarcinoma in situ. After adenocarcinoma in situ, we'll go to frank invasive adenocarcinoma. The third one, I will fill the features in the uh, side. I'm just writing the names now. The third one is going to be invasive adenocarcinoma. Okay, these are three. Atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, adenocarcinoma in situ, and invasive adenocarcinoma. So I need criteria for them. When do I call something atypical adenomatous hyperplasia? First criteria is gonna be size. Very, very tiny lesions, less than five mm. Do you think a less than five mm lesion will present? Do you think any less than five mm lesion will present to us? No, less than five hours, tiny little bit, right? They don't present to us. They'll never present to us. So they are almost always detected incidentally. You do a CT just for some other reason, CT scan for some other reason, I'm going to diagnose this, right? They are incidental diagnosis. Okay. So what do I do when I see this? Keep the patient on follow-up. See, few things, though WHO says that, this is a little bit of an over-diagnosis. I would say from uh, just my opinion, that's all. When medicine becomes too cramped, customer is given more importance, that is patient. This entire thing would have come for the only reason that patients have more power these days. And CT scans are stored in the archives for 20, 30 years. So if I miss this, if the radiologist missed this, the patient is going to go back and say that you missed a 5 mm lesion. But that's how the medicine is, and that's how we are going to practice. Even the tiny little one, I should not miss. So that I'll keep the patient on follow up. If it goes to adenocarcinoma in stool, let's see what to do. But yes, till this also is required very, very early. Early diagnosis, little bit of better prognosis. Fine. Next one is uh, the criteria is I'll have few scattered dysplastic cells. Fine. I didn't know customer in situ. Uh, in situ is there's only one difference between in-situ and invasion, which is a malignancy, which is invasion, right? So here I'll have five millimeter to three centimeter lesions. The entire alveoli will be lined by dysplastic cells. You know how a dysplastic cell will look. What will be the color of dysplastic cell? You know that the color of dysplastic cell is going to be Blue in color, perfect. The same thing, I'm gonna say the same thing again and again, not only in the lung, anywhere in the body you read, it's the same thing. I'm gonna have alveoli lined by dysplastic cell. So I'll just draw an alveoli here. And we'll draw a blue cell, not only blue, very size, pleomorphic. One will be big, one may be small, draw whatever you want. If you're not good at drawing, carcinoma is the best picture you can draw, right? I have dysplastic cells. I have one thing here. There's no invasion. Invasion means, what is this part of the lung called as? The space between two alveoli, what do, they, what do you call it? You must have read them in histology. You call them interstitium, perfect. So I don't have a cell moving to the interstitium. There's no cell moving to the interstitium. It's not going to come here. That's what I mean by in situ. Here I don't have dermis, here I have alveoli and interstitium, right? Now you're going to tell me how to differentiate adenocarcinoma in situ from adenocarcinoma. The only difference is invasion. But for an undergraduate, put your pens down and listen to me. But for undergraduate, it is difficult for them to see one single cell. You are going to tell me with your basic knowledge of physiology and histology and anatomy, a cell, a cell, listen to me carefully, this cell is going to come to my interstitium. Will 
interstitium have any kind of response to it? Yes or no? Will there be any response to the, by the interstitium? Yes, perfect, fibrosis, name it. Perfect, desmopresia, that's done, that's all. You guys know more than most of the pathologists know. Desmoplasia. Now we'll go back to basics. What does desmo mean? Desmo means fibers. That also you must have read in your first year of MBBS. Syndesmotic joints, fibrous joints, united by fibers. Desmo means fibers, plasia means growth, desmoplasia. Desmoplasia, fibrous growth. The tumor will be uh, firm or soft. If there's more fibrosis, tumor will be firm or soft? Firm. Take surgical textbook of DAS. It'll be given firm to heart tumor on palpation, I think of a cancer because of desmoplasia and microscopy. That desmoplasia is because of tissue in response to invasion. Everything is dots and everything is linked, right? So what I want to say here is, when there is no desmoplasia in the interstitium, for an undergraduate, I'm going to think of adenocarcinoma in situ, right? So there'll be no invasion. That's what theoretically it is. And there'll be no desmoplasia. Okay. If an image is given, what happens? Sometimes it becomes difficult, right? That also is simple. Image is only two colors. Desmoplasia, fibrosis. What is the color? Pink or blue? Just two colors. Say anything. 50% correct. Pink. So if I see a lung alveoli, with no pink color, only blue color, I'm going to think of an in-situ carcinoma. I'll show you one more image. I'll show you an image. You're going to tell me in carcinoma or in-situ. See, this is an image. Just a second, yeah. So in this image, this is a gland. Accepted? Accepted? A gland. A gland. Perfect? This is interstitium. Do you see desmoplasia or not? Yes or no? What is the color of interstitium here? Color of interstitium is pink. Desmoplasia present or not? Yes. Adenocarcinoma or in situ? Adenocarcinoma or in situ? It is adenocarcinoma. Perfect. You guys were able to diagnose adenocarcinoma of lung. What else you want? Close your textbooks, be happy. Right? Basic things. You don't want to be an intellectual genius to diagnose things. Fine. Uh, no, uh, Sarna, the cells in the interstitium will not be neoplastic when I'm talking about an adenocarcinoma. Interstitial cells are generally uh, mesenchymal tissue. When I'm having a sarcoma of lung, it will be a bit too much for you guys. Sarcoma of lung will have problems in the interstitium. But generally, interstitial lungs will not be abnormal, will not be neoplastic because they are response to this neoplasia. That's all. Fine. So for a clue for you, if in microscopy, when there's no pink color, this is just a surrogate marker to say it's no dysmoplasia, means in situ. So the only difference between this and adenocarcinoma, which is invasive adenocarcinoma is invasion, that's all. Any size, even if it is 2 mm having invasion, I'm going to call it adenocarcinoma. Any size, size doesn't matter here. If there is invasion present, I'm going to call it adenocarcinoma. That's the only thing required. How do you identify invasion? You go with desmoplasia. I'm going to go with desmoplasia. If desmoplasia present, it's going to be invasion present. Desmoplasia will be pink in color. You can identify images easily. I don't have Robbins as of now. Robbins has an image of bron uh, adenocarcinoma in situ. Go there, you will have a slide without any invasion. Sorry, without any desmoplasia. You can easily identify that. So I need to uh, give uh, pathologist touch, right? Always they think about something, imagine something and give a difficult, different term and make us worry. So this adenocarcinoma in situ, it's more common for, it's seen in adenocarcinoma as well, but adenocarcinoma in situ, it's just alveoli with cells, dysplastic cells. It's an alveoli is like this and lined by dysplastic cells, right? So if you cut the alveoli, if you make them a straight line, it's going to look like this, right? And the dysplastic cells will be like this. Abnormal varied cells. This 
for the person when the first person looked at it for him or her i don't know who it is it looked like butterfly sitting on a fence only two possibility extremely imaginative or high on cocaine mostly cocaine otherwise you won't have this much of imagination this looked like butterflies or birds sitting on a fence and they call it an lepidic pattern okay lepidic pattern of growth right this may be asked for in viva session because pathologists like this fancy terms nothing fancy in that same dysplastic cells i give it different terms so you get a cube for that also right you answer it you have to remember the cocaine story when you answer it so that it will you ease your mentality you will be happily asking answering a viva when you are happy the exam will get sad right that's how viva is mind game you smile exam will get irritated don't smile too much they may fail you fine okay that's about adenocarcinoma we know about etiology clinical features like x ray diag microscopy and one more thing which is left is ihc ihc for squamous cell carcinoma was if you remember without looking back type the answer and ihc for lung primary adenocarcinoma is two main ihc perfect p40 and p63 good two main ihc for lung adenocarcinoma ttf1 and napsin a these are two main ihcs for lung primary adenocarcinoma fine that's all about adenocarcinoma the next one is carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor do you guys want a break or can i continue hello continue great final continue super that's a spirit so next one is going to be neuroendocrine tumors so we have something called as neuroendocrine tumors so this is spectrum neuroendocrine tumors is a uh, big uh, thing under which i have three tumors mainly carcinoid atypical carcinoid and small cell carcinoma what we saw in squamous and adenoma was normal metaplasia dysplasia cancer here it is just carcinoid carcinoid is also malignant atypical carcinoid is also malignant small cell carcinoma is also malignant i have three things here i'll draw in the form of a table so that it is easier for us to recollect carcinoid atypical carcinoid and small cell carcinoma fine there are three different things the first and the foremost thing which i want to say here is all three are malignant the only thing is the gradation will vary carcinoid is in low grade malignancy small cell carcinoma is in very very aggressive malignancy right this bit low grade performs well better prognosis this is very very aggressive right so how do i differentiate them and how do i diagnose them most of the neuroendocrine tumors are central lesions most of them are central lesions fine and they are also have a very very strong incidence with smoking okay x ray wise i'll not be able to differentiate the main difference between carcinoid atypical carcinoid and small cell carcinoma is going to be my microscopy so carcinoid atypical and small cell carcinoma how do i differentiate based on microscopy i'm writing mx for microscopy clinical features will bit differ especially for small cell carcinoma i will tell them microscopy i have a pattern here the pattern for carcinoid is called as an nesting pattern or an organoid pattern like lepidic we saw for adenocarcinoma here i'm going to have a nesting pattern what does nest mean what does a nest mean i won't ask you difficult questions at all cluster nest is a bird's nest that's all you must have seen a bird's nest right i have some space inside which i have lots of eggs like that nesting pattern is i have a space inside which instead of eggs i'm going to have tumor cells uniform appearing tumor cells eggs appear uniform very less pleomorphism uniform means less pleomorphism less pleomorphism low grade 
I have a nest of tumor cells. I'll show you the nest of tumor cells. This is how it looks. Okay, here you can see a nest. Not exactly always round. It can be round, oval, any shape. But I have something in an enclosed space. A nest of tumor cell is diagnostic of carcinoid. Carcinoid can happen anywhere in the body. Can happen in GIT. When your GI happens, microscopy same, markers same, everything same. Location is only different, right? It can happen anywhere in the GIT. It can happen in the appendix. It can happen in the colon. It can happen in the lung as well, right? Anywhere you see carcinoid, I'm going to have the same finding nesting pattern. Cells, incident, uniform space, and we'll have very less pleomorphism. It's a low grade tumor. So what do you think will happen to mitosis? More or less? Mitosis, mitosis count will be less. I'll have a cutoff. The cutoff is less than two mitosis. And there'll be no necrosis. Whenever you see necrosis in a tumor, it's a bit high grade. There's lots of cell death going on. It's a bit high grade tumor. There's been no necrosis, fine. Okay. Next. So next we are going to go to atypical carcinoid. So what happens in atypical carcinoid is it's a bit away from the regular carcinoid, right? So in atypical carcinoid, it's a bit of high grade. So what happens is first thing, the clustering or uniformity will be gone in an atypical carcinoid, right? There'll be no pattern here. The pattern will start to dissolve in an atypical carcinoid. So what I'll have is I'll have tumor cells more or less in the form of sheets, not completely, more or less in the form of a sheets. Sheets means it's dispersed. That's what I mean by sheets, right? I have dispersed tumor cells. Next, there'll be a little bit more pleomorphism. I'm writing up arrow for more. Increase in pleomorphism. Okay. Mitosis will increase 2 to 10. See, whenever you have a classification like this, I want you to read the center column alone. Remember this because numbers are a bit difficult to remember. Remember 2 to 10. Less than that, left-hand side. Greater than that, small cell carcinoma. Same everywhere. When you read TNM classification, especially, because TNM is in headache. When you read TNM classification, read T2. Less than that, T1. More than that, T3. T4 in most of the organs will be adjacent to such structures. Right? Anywhere. Anywhere when you read a classification, be a little bit smart. So they can have more information with less with less uh, data to remember, right? And yes, I will see necrosis. Microscopy of small cell carcinoma. Again, I'm gonna have sheets of small cell. Extremely high pleomorphism. You'll have mitosis greater than 10. And obviously, you'll have necrosis. In addition to this, I'm going to add one more finding called as an asopardi effect. Small cell carcinomas will have asopardi effect. I'll tell what's an asopardi effect. I'll also tell how to diagnose that. Right? Uh, the classification goes like this. I have to tell two more things for you. One is the nuclear morphology. Another one is the asopardi effect because both are classical for nuclear morphology is classical for all neuroendocrine tumors and also asopardi effect here specifically for small cell carcinoma of lung. Right? First, we'll go with asopardi effect. Okay, we'll write take a new one and we'll write asopardi effect alone. So let's assume that you have. Uh, lots and lots and lots of proliferation of cells in a cancer. That's what cancer basically means. So what happens here is, listen to me, we'll write later on. So what happens here is, I'm going to have lots and proliferation of cancer. When tumor cells proliferate a lot, they also die a lot, right? They also die a lot. So all the dead cells will be removed by my macrophage. In the lung, when a tumor grows big, in the center of the tumor, I'm not going to have much of macrophage. So the necrotic debris will be slowly only removed. 
So what happens here is when I have necrosis, when I have necrosis here in the perivascular region alone, the necrotic debris, which is nothing but you must have read in your uh, first chapter, pycnosis, karyorexis, karyolysis. The lysed debris is getting accumulated here. The lysed debris gets accumulated here. I'll have tumor cells here. The small ones are the tumor cells I'm drawing. And there'll be necrosis also here. Surrounding the blood vessel, I'll have lysed DNA material, which has not been removed yet because of less macrophage activity. And it keeps accumulating. I'm seeing them more in small cell carcinoma. I'm not seeing them in atypical carcinoid and car carcinoid because the amount of cell division is less in atypical carcinoid and carcinoid. When the cell division is less, death rate is less, my macrophage can tackle. But here, it cannot tackle. It supersedes its power. So it gets accumulated. This DNA material accumulation surrounding a vessel is called as an azopardi effect. So you're going to tell me how it looks in a biopsy. Lysed DNA material, color. What is the color of lysed DNA material? Perfect, only one thing blue. I don't have any other color. I'm sure you can identify a vessel. Vessel will be identified by, mostly by RBC's blood, right? So I'll show you an azopardi effect. See, this is a low power image. You can see structures here, rounded, rounded, elongated structures. What are all these things? I've ticked um, quite a few of them. All of them are vessels, right? All of them are vessels. It's a contained space, right? All of them are vessels. When you have the vessels surrounding the perivascular area alone, I'm having the blue color. What has happened to all this tissue? Alive or dead? Wherever the pointer is going, they are alive or dead. You can easily see, what is the color? Wherever the pointer is going, what is the color? Color is pink, only pink, no blue. No blue means no nucleus. No nucleus means dead. So all these are necrotic areas. I have necrosis here. I have vessel here. And surrounding the vessel alone, I'm having the blue color. That's your perfect azopardi effect. Okay, it's a perfect azopardi effect. When you see azopardi effect in a question or in a picture, you're going to think of a small cell carcinoma of a lung or any high grade tumors may have this. In lung, small cell carcinoma. Clear about this? I want to add one more thing for neuroendocrine tumors, the nuclear structure. Okay. Next one, what you're going to do is the nuclear structure. This nuclear chromatin is not only for small cell carcinoma, it is for all neuroendocrine tumors. All neuroendocrine tumors, not only carcinoid, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, nose neuroendocrine tumor, neuroblastoma. Every neuroendocrine tumor have the same nuclear chromatin. And you are going to say why and how. Let's take a nucleus. I'm just drawing a nucleus alone, just a nucleus. I'm putting them, everything is blue in color, okay? Drop down your pen, pen or pencil. We'll understand first, then we'll go to it. I'm having a nucleus which is completely blue in color. That's how it happens. In your uh, biochemistry, what you must have read is nucleus, when I have a nucleus, not all the DNA of the nucleus will be functional. Most of them will be not functional, right? When they are not functional, we call them as euchromatin or heterochromatin. What do we call them? We call them as we call them as heterochromatin, perfect. Heterochromatin is dark or light. Dark, perfect. So when they become functional, they become euchromatin. Euchromatin is light, correct? So small cell carcinomas are neuroendocrine tumors or they secrete substances. So in order to a cell to secrete, my nucleus should be active or inactive? Active which means euchromatin, right? My nucleus should be euchromatin. So this nucleus, what's going to happen is, I'm going to have the chromatin getting opened up or in other words, it becomes lighter. Not white in color, bit lighter. So here and there and here and there and here and there, I'll have lighter chromatin. 
because this cell is functional, they're going to secrete substances. So this is what I'm going to see in microscopy. It looks like this. Try to give a term to this. Try to give a term to this. If you read your uh, textbooks, you'll know the name which I'm arriving to. Mott, uh, something else read me. Anyone else want to try out something? This is called as an, when you read back, you'll definitely recollect it. This is called as an salt and pepper chromatin. Yeah, this is called as an salt and pepper chromatin. Fine. Mott means a grape-like cluster. This is not a grape-like cluster, right? I'm having, uh, maybe salt and pepper will be a bit difficult to extrapolate. The person who first saw it, for him it looked like salt and pepper. So he called it salt and pepper chromatin. Salt and pepper chromatin is common for every neuroendocrine tumor. Not only carcinoid, carcinoid, atypical, small cell carcinoma, pheochromocytomas, neuroblastomas, any secreting tumor will have this appearance. You can generalize it. I'm just giving you basic things. You're going to put permutation combinations. You can write any question. Don't worry about a question or an exam. You can excel an exam. You should know how to confuse examiner. That's what you read in your first year of MBBS, right? So with that, with that basic knowledge, you can easily clear any exam. So I'll have this as well. Okay. So I know the classification. I know the microscopic appearance. I know two main salient features. The next thing for any cancer is going to be IHC. Here I have three IHC, synaptophysin. What is the IHC for lung adenocastoma? If you remember, without turning pages, type chromogranin. And CD56. Perfect. TTF1 and napsin A. These three are the markers for neuroendocrine tumors of the lung. Not only neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, any neuroendocrine carcinoma in the body, these three markers. Small cell carcinoma of uh, external genitalia, same marker. Neuroblastoma, same marker. Pheochromocytoma tumor cells, same marker. Any neuroendocrine, I'm going to use the same marker. So till now, what I'm speaking about neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine, they're going to secrete. Can they cause symptoms? If something is being secreted, they will cause symptoms, right? So they may present as carcinoid syndrome. Though it is rare for and lung carcinoid, they might present. So symptoms, sometimes they may present as carcinoid syndrome. Okay. So they're going to secrete substances which causes diarrhea, flushing, bronchospasm, Right. This could be the presentation of carcinoid syndrome because of serotonin secretion by these tumor cells. Right. This is more common in GA carcinoid than in lung carcinoid. But yes, you have to know about this as well. Okay. Do you have any queries till now? If you have any queries till now, do let me know. No queries means only two possibility. You understood everything or you didn't understand anything. I hope it's the first one. Understood everything. Divya, how to identify mitotic figures? See, um, microscopy mitotic figures may not be required for an undergraduate, but still, since you have asked, you must have read mitos in your 11th standard, 10th standard. You will have something like this. Right? A cell will pull its mitotic spindle in two ways. When you have blue color, instead of a single brown thing, it's a nucleus. You see two things like this. That is mitosis. It's been pulled apart. That's all. That's how we identify mitotic figures. Normal, typical mitosis looks like that. Okay. Any other doubt? No other doubts. Do you have everything? Dr. Benchit. Fine. So those are the few main things about 
lung tumors. I just want to add one more tumor alone because most of the time they do travel along pleural tumor, the mesothelioma. Just a few minutes. Okay. Pleural tumor of mesothelioma. Just pleural cancers. Just a second. Just one second. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I just want to add pleural tumors and mesothelium alone. Mesothelium can be asked in an MCQ uh, or in your short notes, sometimes in your uh, viva as well. If they're going to ask in viva, they're going to link one thing to mesothelium, which is asbestos exposure, right? Pleural tumors, mesothelium, it's a specific tumor secondary to asbestos expo exposure. It's a specific tumor secondary to asbestos exposure. M malignant mesothelioma, right? Malignant mesothelioma is more common. Uh, it's very, very rare in India. It's common in countries which have shipping industries. Okay. Uh, Indians do have shipping industries, not so common. We don't manufacture ship. We may have Navy. That's totally different. This is seen people are exposed to asbestos in shipping industry not traveling in ship, manufacturing ships. So it's a bit rare in a country, common in the China, which manufactures major ships and also common in the Western Caucasian countries, which also is involved in manufacturing ship, fine. The most important clue in mesothelioma is latent period. The latent period is huge for mesothelioma. Most of the tumors you must have read about a latency period of uh, like five to 10, 10 years. Mesothelioma needs at least 25 to 40 to 45 or 50 years of latency period. The latency period is very important for mesothelioma. Which I mean here is, there's an exposure to asbestos. Again, this will not happen one day exposure to asbestos. It should be for a quite a number of time. After exposure, I need a latency period of 25 to 45 years. Only then you'll have a cancer. When either the cancer originates and cancer, if I'm having cancer today, I will not present today. I will present after some time only, right? So it's going to present even after five to 10 years later. Years later, the patient presents. The only way of presentation is the lung pleura will become thicker and thicker and thicker and will cause breathing difficulties. That's how the patient will present. So the most important clue is age. Most of the mesothelioma will be in seventh or eighth decade. Before that, it's a bit rare, right? Most of them will be in seventh or eighth decade. That will be the most important clue if you have a uh, university exam question where you have to solve and go to mesothelioma. But lung cancer, a little bit earlier, like fifth or sixth decade, yes, they can present. But mesothelioma always in the edge, fine, long. And Grossly, what I'll see is, I'll see only one thing, thick and pleura. I'll not have a mass in the pleura. The pleura will be uniformly thicker. Okay? Pleura will have uniform thickening. And neurofibromatosis 2, NF2 gene, is supposed to be associated with mesothelioma. Genetic basis, NF2 gene, your neurofibromatosis is 2G, okay? And tumor suppressor gene, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, 2A gene also is associated with mesothelioma. Fine. 
So mesothelial tissue is uh, mesothelium arises from mesothelial tissue. What is the immunohistochemistry marker which you know for any mesothelial tissue? Do you know any marker for any mesothelial tissue? For epithelium, we have something called a cytokeratin. For mesothelium, we have Wymantin for generalized mesothelium, and here we are going to use a marker called Calretin. That's for IHC. For that microscopy, mesothelioma may not be going in deep about mesothelioma. Just we'll remember the two basic subtypes of mesothelioma. epithelioid mesothelioma and sarcomatoid epithelioid will be bit difficult to identify for an undergraduate definitely i just i just told these two things to tell you one more basic clue oid whenever you have oid which means like oid means like epithelioid granulomas epithelioid cells epithelial like cells lymphoid lymphocyte like amyloid amyloid like sarcomatoid means looks like a sarcoma epithelioid means looks like a carcinoma that's the difference fine ihc for mesothelioma remember two markers calretinin what is the ihc for small cell or neuroendocrine tumors just put the first letters that's enough calretinin and wt1 snaptofisin perfect chromogranin and cd56 right perfect so three markers for neuroendocrine tumors and for mesothelioma we have this two markers okay those are in short about lung tumors i have not discussed a little bit few tumors in detail like there are few more tumors that are there in robins Well, I'll leave it to you. These are the bulk of the thing which is required for undergraduate. I'm sure if you know this, and little bit addition here and there, you can e easily complete the entire Robbins. I want you to read Robbins, and only Robbins, no other textbook, uh, no other textbook, only Robbins. Don't say it's big. You have one and a half years. You have only one job to read. You will read, and it's it's a good book. You keep reading, you will learn to like it. You try to integrate with if you're going to your clinics now. try to integrate with every patient you see come back and read the books you know about the pathogenesis it makes the entire process very simple and very happy to read fine any doubts otherwise we'll call it a day dr ranjit if you have any doubts after any time while reading i will be there on uh, all your social media whichever you are there i am also there spoiled more than you my name is ranjit ar you can find me anywhere you can ask me questions Dr. Ranjit, anything related to pathology? I'll try to answer. Dr. Ranjit, can you hear me? Dr. No Ranjit, I am Dr. Febi. Ma'am is trying to talk. I cannot hear her. Sai Ganesh, yes, uh, it's rather than spreading, peritoneal mesothelioma can also happen. Primary peritoneal tumors can also happen, not like spread. It's a def totally different tumor. It might also spread. Ma'am, you can talk. Anirudh is ma'am talking. I'm not able to hear, ma'am. Are others able to hear? Ma'am, we can talk now. Ma'am, can you hear us?
Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Ah, yes. Dr. Ranjit. Dr. Ranjit. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, looks like sir is not able to hear. Uh, ah, yes, you please yes, yes. Ah. Chat, uh, send in the chat section. I think uh, he has switched. Uh, no, no, I can hear, ma'am. I can hear. Yes, that when she time, that the Febby. Though I have. Uh, WhatsApp to you, message to you, coordinated, but uh, I haven't seen you. It was a very excellent, interactive, and illustrative. Thank you so much. I think I am 30 years senior to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 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 amazing. Very good. Amazing. I think they won't forget lung tumors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.